Okay, so you have got great stories. Uh, this is Connie Rufner. I am the interviewer, and we are talking to Anne Montebell, and she's the narrator for this one. Uh, so you have been telling us some really wonderful stories. Uh, you were a teacher. You were a home ec teacher? Yes. Okay, and where did you teach? I taught in East Brady for two years, and I taught in Cornwall where our governor taught. In uh -huh. Pine Grove Mills, and I lived four miles from Lebanon, and I rode, I never drove, uh -huh. I always walked. I never owned a car till I got married. My husband bought it for me. So I'm not much of a driver either. So where all did you walk to? I walked to all my students' homes twice a year, and met all their parents, and ate, ate with them, you know. I. And then I remember Alice, I had to chaperone dances. We had to make this, the uh, pattern of the uh, things for the uh, plays. Had to do that too, you know, make all the costumes and stuff. And I remember, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, so I was chaperoning, and so I was dancing with the kids, you know. Uh huh. And then I asked her to dance. She said, "You're not going to dance with me." I said, "Why not?" Why? Well, she said. Because I'm colored. I said, are you colored? I'm colorblind. I thought you were like everybody else, aren't you? She said, nobody ever da I said, well, I'm dancing with you because you're a better dancer than I am. You know. Now, when was that? What year was well, it? Well, that was in 1943. And how old were you? 23. See, I was only 20 when I started. So you were born in 1920? 1920, uh-huh. So that was... That was that, what I did with Alice. And then the cafeteria worker, oh, Mr. Light said, are you going down to, what was her name? I should know it. I said, yes. She said, she'll never let you in the place. I said, you watch me. So I went down and I said, you know what? I was watching, she made the best pies. She was a wonderful cook. The only thing is she'd wipe her brow with the apron and then she'd roll the dough, you know. And I thought that won't hurt, the few germs won't kill us. I said, you know what? I'm going to come down and watch you cook. Because I read it in the book, but there's nothing like watching people are, expect, are you know, very uh -huh. good at it. So I went down. Then I said, now that I've learned how I can do it, how about let me bring a couple of my students down? And she let me. So um, you said when you went to teach, when you first went to teach, and you went up to East Brady, and they had a home act room for you. Only for the people that have wealth. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people were on relief down there. Okay, so yeah. so all the people were on relief, and they had electric yeah, well, sewing machines at the home. was a very low income home. group. In, yes. yes, up there. Oh, yes. I mean, there was only, Repside was there as a factory. Uh huh. But nobody had money those days. I told you I made 1200 a year. Right. And I paid $10.00 a week for my room and I had to pay to eat with Mrs. Miller, Belle Miller. Her daughter was the secretary at the school. So when you went then they had three electric sewing machines and you told them that Everything was electric. Mm -hmm. Right. I right. didn't want it. And then I wanted a coal stove, gas stove, and an electric stove. So they could learn to how to mm -hmm. cook uh, and sew on what right. they had. Yes. And then I remember I said, now we're going to have chicken. No, I watched my mother clean it, and I said to Bill Abernathy, bring me in a chicken. Said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to have it. I said, I never cleaned one, Bill. He said, I'll take care of it. So I said to the kids, Bill Abernathy's cut, killing the chicken, so we looked out, and it was uh -huh. running all over, you know. So uh -huh. then I had the hot water, and we went down, we plucked it and cleared it and stuff. That was the only time I ever did it. But the kids, the kids had to do that at home. Yeah, I right. mean, they, they didn't have... Uh, cut up chicken like we have now, you know. So you really taught them how to actually live on nothing. Live, yeah. And how to buy. And then I had catalogs, and I say, your son, your husband makes twenty dollars a week. Now you're going to buy furniture. Now you have to pick out how much you're going to spend and how you're going to budget it. And I did all those things. Then I decided, after I was in there for four years, I when I went to Mercyhurst. I went to Mercyhurst, Penn State, Carlo, and IUP. So when I went to Penn to uh, uh, Penn State, no, when I went down there, 
I got a job down in Cornwall. Then I left there and I was going to get my master's in English and Eleanor said to me, come and be my dietitian. I said, I don't know a thing about dietetics. She said, I'll teach you. So I worked for her for a year for $100 a month. And uh, then she had me do the lab work from the lab. They'd come in with blood stuff. So uh -huh. I had to do that while they were eating, you know. So I uh -huh. learned how to do that. Then my husband said to me, why don't you get a job in Pittsburgh? I get tired coming clear to here. I said, oh, I don't know. Because I, I was never going to get married. So I said, okay. So then I went up to Suburban General. Oh, I worked as a dietitian at, uh, at uh, West Penn for one summer, $50 uh -huh. a week, month, a month. So then I went there. I worked as a soda jerker too at Big uh -huh. Surly's in Ohio River Boulevard, I worked there. <laughs> I worked in Sylvania one summer. I worked at the Hershey plant one, one summer. Did you really? Making candy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of different things. Never made money, but and never got in trouble, you know. But uh, anyway, I decided then to go to Pittsburgh. And then I, I was a diet, suburb, I, I was therapeutic dietitian, special diet. Then Mr. Mills called me up. He was the administrator and he said, come on up. He said, uh, I want to see you. I went up and he said, would you like, I want you to be the administrative dietitian and therapeutic. I said, what? I said, I'm getting my degree. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm taking a train, a bus into Carlo. And I walked up all the steps at that time. And then I had to serve meals to the night people. Oh, I had to do everything. So you were born in, where were you born? I was born in Brandy Camp. Now where's it's Brandy Camp? A, it's um, right outside of Brockway and Ridgeway. It's a small little mining town. And uh, my which, dad was a check weighman at the mine. Uh huh. My grandfather had a big store there. Uh huh. A, he had a butcher shop. You know, we made pizza. My Uncle Sylvia gave us the recipe for the pizzas that we made years ago. You know, we had a pizza shop up here and an ice cream stand. Uh huh. Uh -huh. My husband had that. My husband was a graduate of Penn State, but he was a. Uh, uh, he graduated in animal husbandry, but he was a salesman. But he could foresee that this town needed, some, the kids needed something, and I wanted to put up a nursing home, and he said, no, we have to worry about the kids. He said, I never learned to swim. He said, I'm putting in a pool. We didn't even have the, the stand paid for, and every year he'd make it bigger. Uh -huh. I said, make the pool big enough so we don't have to enlarge it, so he made the pool. And then we had to borrow 450000 for that. I had to sign for that. And then, that wasn't paid for, and he decided hockey was the sport of tomorrow. Uh -huh. So he put in the rink for seven hundred and fifty thousand, and that wasn't paid for. And we let the kids that didn't have anything go in for nothing. And I would give the ones that were bad free memberships so they could help me, because I'd say, "You're so bad, you know all the bad kids." And then I had a tablet and a dictionary in the office, <laughs> and if they swore, I had them come in and and write the. Uh, and, and write the, uh, let me see, you know, when you when, when you look the words up, definition, uh -huh. write definition. I said, your vocabulary is too limited. Uh-huh. Because you don't have to swear. Now you pick up some more words. My his husband used to get mad at me. I said, oh, you shut up. I'm taking care of them my, my own way. So I did that, too, to them. Because I always tried to help them. Uh-huh. You know, I wasn't mean to them. And I told this one kid, I said, I'm going to tell you how bad your reputation is. I said, if you were standing here with Gary and you had, and Gary had $40 in his hand and the police came up and somebody was missing $40, they would say that you're the one that took it and gave it to Gary. I said, that's how bad you are. Now I said, I want to change that image of you. I want you to learn to be nice and to be thoughtful 
and not steal. If you want anything, I'll give it to you. If you don't have enough to eat, I'll give you a pizza. I said, but, but don't be like you are. So I helped him. My husband said, you always get the, I said, Hugo, anybody can be good. These kids are single parents, they have no money. They don't have anything to do. So, uh -huh. and I went down and one of the county commissioners to get a bus and get all the kids off the street and take them up free. Uh -huh. They wouldn't do it. That's good. That's good then we put in a little league field because he wanted the kids to play baseball. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I told you about the lady that said they came from uh, Furnace Run and they'd come up with their lunches. Yeah, tell that. And take a shower up there because they didn't have it at Furnace Run. Then he'd take them home at night if it were bad, and he always took the kids home. He never let them walk when they played hockey or anything. He made sure they got home safe. He was a man of all seasons, and he died at 58. And I was 60. I've been a widow for 33 years now. Long time. Yeah, very long time. Yep. Yeah. How did you meet him? I met him up at Penn State. My girlfriend was looking for a husband. I wasn't going to ever get married. I, that wasn't in my my schedule. And her name was Virginia DeCecco from Erie. She said she wanted to get married at Penn State. So she said, let's go out. And where will we go? She said, let's go to the movies. I said, you don't find a man at the movies. It's dark. You can't even talk, right? We went to the movies, and you know, I didn't have any money. I had to spend a quarter to go to the movies for a man that she didn't even find. <laughs> so after World, she said, uh, well, let's go to the Skeller. Gary has a picture of the Skeller now. I said, oh, I don't drink. I never drank. Never drank till I got married. I let the guys drink because they always tell you the truth then. Uh -huh. that. They said, you're so strange. I said, I know I'm strange, and I'm going to stay that way. Uh -huh. And so... And if I, if they ordered me a 7-Up and I went to the bathroom, I'd come back and I'd say, here's a quarter, order me another one. You could have put something in that drink, you know. So I was smart, but I was stupid, but I was foxy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so anyway, we went to the Skeller and we walked in and I had on a white pleated skirt and I had long black wavy hair, you know, and a pink sweater. And I was... 23 or 24 and we walked in and went to the bathroom I said to Virginia there's nothing here either all the booths are full so when we walked out Hugo emptied the booth so I said hey Virginia here's the booth and he goes oh he was smooth would you lovely ladies care to join me I said what do you mean join you we we thought the booth was empty he said well just my friends are leaving he said but you may stay so I went out and I said, hey, he's a wolf, you watch that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> so then we went back and sat down and I, of course I said, I'm not drinking that. Uh -huh. And and I said, then I said, then we'll have, I'll go home first. So when we got out there, he decided I was going home last. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I was smoking then. And he was trying to tell me, why do you smoke? I said, because it's none of your business. You know, I said, I do what I want. My mother bossed me. I said, I'm my own boss. And so I went and he took me home. And then about, this was summer school. I was taking a 500 course in history so I can have an extra minor. So he came and he said, uh, he brought me a carton of Luckies. And he says, here they are, but you look awful when you smoke. I said, I know, but it's a principal little thing. I just don't like people telling me anything. So then he wanted to date me. He said, who are those jerks you're dating with? I said, oh, I'm going to, I go up to a student union because I had to study to get my grades, you know. I had good grades, but I worked for them. So he says, uh, they're all jerks. He said, how about a date? I said, well, we'll talk about it. So we went out, we went to Old Main and he put his jacket on me and he wanted to know how tall my father was and how tall my mother was. I said, well, I think she was 5'10". I think my dad was 6'2". I don't know. What diseases do you have? I said, well, I don't know. I think we have tuberculosis. And he did a case history on me. What do you like to do? And uh -huh. what are your interests? I said, I like drama. And I, I don't like anything dirty or sexy. I said, I'm not into that. 
I don't know any stories. I hate that. And I says, and I like the beautiful things in life, mm -hmm. and I like the underdog. I like to mm -hmm. work, I, but I'll work with everybody, mm -hmm. but I prefer helping the poor and the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and I said to Mrs. Schaefer, you know what? I never had a crazy date like this. Guess what happened? It had nothing to do with sex. So I don't know. I said, he did a case history on me. I never had anybody want to know how tall everybody was in my family or anything. So then uh, I went down to IF Ball with him and I had a, made a white dress. And Jim Tremarchi, the Tremarchi from Fort City, was uh -huh. his relative, was his roommate. And I said, now remember, you sleep, I sleep. When I come, I sleep in my room and you go home. You don't sleep in my room. Mm -hmm. That'll be a rule. Okay. So I said, but I, I said to him, you know what? I said, catch me. I want, I'm going to fall backwards. I want you to catch me. Guess what? What? He didn't catch me and I went down like a <laughs> bump on a log. And I said, why didn't you catch me? He said, Cause I never had a date that was that crazy. He said, who ever heard of falling on the floor? I said, well, I learned that at Mercyhurst. <laughs> that was our phys ed course. <laughs> and I wanted to show you how I could fall. He said, well, you fell on the floor. So that was one episode of, of crazy things I did. I did a lot of dumb things, but a lot of fun things. And then he kept dating me and dating me and dating me and, and, uh, I finally, we got married, we, were, we set the date about 10 times and then the last time he set it for Labor Day. And he said, if you don't marry me Labor Day, I said, I don't want to get married Labor Day now because I'll be in labor all the time. I said, I don't want that date either. He said, well, you're either going to get married Labor Day or I'm leaving. Oh, well, so we set the date. And then the night before he told his mother and dad he didn't want to marry me and I told my mother I wasn't going to get married. And both of them said to each of us, you better not make fools of us at the altar. Uh -huh. You've been going together and fighting back and forth for years. Now you're either going to say yes or we're going to come up in the altar and make you say it. So that's how we got married. But we've had a wonderful, I was glad I married him because he was a wonderful person. Yeah. And he did a lot for everybody. He was a man who, a man of all seasons. But we had differences, you know, because I had my ideas and he had his. But I always tell the kids, let them be boss. You know why? Because if something's wrong, it's his fault. So if something's wrong, it's his fault, and let them drink because then they'll tell the truth. And what? <laughs> I, said, I said, if something's wrong, then it's their fault. And, right, like my kids, and you should had... let them drink because then they'll tell the truth. That's right. But then, you know, when they went to the prom, they had to be in at 11. And my son, Tom, was a restaurant, a big football player, and a big time. He went to Princeton, which I hate. I didn't want him going there. Sorry he went there, but he went anyway. But he had a scholarship. He had a lot of scholarships. But anyway, I said, you know what? He met my mother, and he asked her how tall my father was. <laughs> my father. <laughs> He's still dating me. My mother said, oh, I think his name was Amadeo. I love God as a name. Uh -huh. Amadeo Louis Nazoni was his name. And she said, oh, I think, they called him Porky. She said, I think Porky was about five, eleven and a half. He was about a half inch tall. He said to me, you told me he was six foot two. I said, Hugo, he died when I was three years old. Did you think I measured him in the casket? <laughs> so he was, because he wanted tall children because he had dairy husbandry where they bred cattle and they had certain characteristics they needed in the cattle. cattle. And he wanted a tall family because all his parents, his parents were short. So that's why he asked you all that? Yeah, to make sure he wasn't, and I had to be Catholic. Then he found out I was half Austrian. He thought I was a mongrel then. <laughs> Well, you said you had tuberculosis and you were in a sanitarium. When yes. You, when did that 1948, happen? In 1948, uh, we were going up to Boston Lion Inn Hospital. Mr. Mills was my CEO at the Good Samaritan. He went there. And we always liked Mr. 
you know, and I always said I was going up there, so we were driving up, and I was getting car sick, and this was, we were married in September. This was, we'll say, probably four or five months after we were married. And I said, oh, I'm so car sick. So you could say, well, we're going to drive back. I said, no, I want to go to Boston. He said, no. He said, you're so sick. I said, oh, I know. I'm just car sick. I always get car sick when I ride. So we came back and they found out I had, uh, I was pregnant. So the doctor said, we're going to abort you. I said, no, you're not. He said, you're going to die. I said, well, I'm going to die, but you're not aborting me. So then I went to the sanitarium on my birthday, and Hugo gave me, sent me flowers that day. And I can remember walking in, and the blanket had tuberculosis sanitarium. Oh, and that was like having... Really? Oh, at that time, it was like having, uh, what disease? Worse than cancer like the plague, uh -huh. cause uh -huh. it was horrible, you know. And so I went and I told Dr. Spencer, I said, you're not gonna abort me. He said, nope, we never do. He said, but I wanna tell you, after you have the, you won't, it'll be okay while you're carrying it, but after you have the baby, that's when we have to watch you, that's when you break down again. So that's why I had to keep going back. Then I had two more after that. And I wouldn't, I didn't want to be around them. I never was positive, but I didn't, I wanted to make sure uh -huh. that they didn't do it. So I had, my mother raised the two, the, and then my daughter who's up there, she died at 19. She was in an accident. And then I have Tom who's down in Maryland. And he's going to be 60, Marianne was 63, and Abe, she'll be 63, and he'll be 61, and Gary will be 59 at Christmas Eve. Your husband, he was in the war. Did, was did he go to Europe or? Oh yeah, he was on the hospital ship. Oh really? Uh, on the Andrea Dora, and his parents went over to the Andrea Dora to Italy, and when they came back, and landed, and then the next time it went over, it sunk or something. So he was on the Andrea Dora, and then his brother was in the service, and he was in France and Italy. Yeah, they were all in the service. And I remember somebody, Evelyn, told me that her aunt said that Roosevelt is sending all our butter to Russia because we had rations then, you know, mm -hmm. and gas rations. It mm -hmm. didn't bother me because I didn't drive. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was uh, teaching in East Brady, uh, <laughs> what was her name? Oh, Janet Elder said, why don't we go to Pittsburgh and go to the play? I said, I don't have any money. Uh -huh. I said, I don't have any money. She said, well, we'll just go. It only takes about $35. We'll catch the bus. We'll catch the train. Now, you had to go to the school board meeting, get permission to leave a half hour early. Uh-huh. You know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then we had to get the ticket. And I went home to Mrs. Lowther, where I lived, and I said, hey, Mrs. Lowther, I want to go to Pittsburgh. Do you still want to buy my coat? <laughs> because I had this camel hair coat that she liked, and she always I really like that coat. I'll give you $25 for that coat if you ever want to sell it. I said, she used to beg for a living. I said, do you still want my coat? She said, yeah, why? Well, I said, I want to go to see a play with Janet down in Pittsburgh, <laughs> and I need $35. She said, I'll give you 35 So I sold the coat. <laughs> and went to the play with Janet and we came back. We stayed one night at the hotel and came back the next day so we could teach Monday. And when I went home, my mother said, I had the old coat on, she said, where's your coat? Uh -huh. I said, I sold it. She said, what? <laughs> she said, I made $2 an hour. You know how long it took me to buy that coat? I said, I can't help it, Mom. I, I don't do anything in East Brady except go bowling once a week and I can't even afford a thing. And Janet and I decided to go. So she never forgave me for selling her coat. Do you, do you remember what the play was? No, I can't remember the play. Did you enjoy it? Oh yeah, we had a good time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Thank you. We really appreciate it.